Hi, I'm Dara Fitz and welcome to Seeker Psychology. Now, many of you will know by now that we take some deep dives into the practices and habits of elite athletes. We look at what they do, why they do it, and what outcome you could expect from the same inputs if you were to do it yourself. But mostly on this channel, coaches remain sacred. We don't call them out, we don't pick their reasoning apart, because we understand there's nuance to coaching and also we see that everyone's situation is slightly different. But today, we're going to have a bit of a dive into the weeds on some particularly clunky language used by one of martial arts' most respected representatives, John Danaher. So John talked about two things in this Lex Friedman interview that kind of piqued my interest. I was doing some research and some script writing on a video I'm doing later on in the week involving confidence and particularly confidence in the sport of weightlifting with some slightly tainted or possibly incorrect language. So this first clip is John talking about confidence and what makes people or what makes athletes in particular confident. I really think that people, when they talk about mental preparation, need to take a step back and realize that almost every element of what people describe as mental preparation has physical underpinnings. Um, literally 95% of what I teach the athletes is physical skills. And it's my belief that every mental aspect of competition, the most important of which will be confidence on stage, is a direct result of the, the accumulation of physical skills. People tend to see things like confidence as a mental state. It is. But it comes out of the performance of physical skills. So what is confidence? Well, to reference a paper from the late 80s, a Vili paper, confidence in sport is the belief or degree of certainty individuals possess about their ability to be successful in sport. This addresses the degree to which an athlete is sure of his or her ability. And now this seems quite simple, and it is. But what about when we start to break this down a small bit more? All my life, I've seen sports psychologists try to create confidence in athletes through non-physical means. And it always ends up being the same kind of cheesy motivational speeches, um, highlight video reels where they try to pump artificial confidence into people. Okay, so there's a number of things here I think we should talk about, and we'll start with confidence first. So I think the biggest error people make is thinking confidence is some sort of personality trait. It's certainly something in popular media or just general conversation. You'll hear people saying, oh, that girl is really confident. That guy's really confident or that athlete is a very confident athlete or fighter. And that's a small bit flawed in our thinking. So confidence is very much a state we operate in. And we can be highly confident in certain aspects of our lives and not so confident in other aspects. So when you hear a coach like this saying the only way for somebody to become more confident in sport is just by acquiring skills, that's really not true. So if you imagine the, the high school athletes who might be very, very confident at playing football or lacrosse or basketball, they're probably, they may not be so confident in their academic studies or in a social setting or something along those lines. If we take that thinking then and we apply it to just one athlete in just one sport, it would be flawed to think that the only way an athlete will become more confident is just by acquiring more skills or by refining the skills they have. In this table, from the Handbook of Sports Medicine, the volume on sports psychology, the chapter on confidence, we see that self-confidence in sport is made up of physical self-confidence and emotional regulation self-confidence. So we see here the physical self-confidence has multiple aspects in here, skill execution, skill acquisition, physical fitness, and then on the other side we see levels of emotional control, levels of cognitive control, and things like that. So confidence and self-confidence in sport in particular comes from a number of areas, and we shouldn't just see it as, oh, that person has more skills, or as we develop skills we may become more confident. That's certainly true, and it will certainly help, but it's not the only thing you're to think about. The next thing then is John talking about sports psychologists. And I think this is just something that he might have had a bad experience with somebody who's not a sports psychologist or maybe multiple people who aren't sports psychologists. 
there's a lot of witch doctor gurus out there uh i will say if you're looking for information on sports psychology or if you're an athlete looking to go to a sports psychologist make sure these people are qualified make sure they're registered sports psychologists if they're carrying out interventions with you and that they're not just some sort of motivational speaker who likes to make instagram reels while they're running up a mountain these things are very very different so let's look at the the motivational video piece which kind of makes me cringe to be honest uh, and John talking about that being the only thing a sports psychologist will do I've been graced with the presence of a huge amount of sports psychologists in my professional life and in my life in academia my postgrad work obviously was in sports psychology so I've met a lot of professional uh, and academic sports psychologists and to be honest I've never heard of any of them using a motivational video as a tool or as any aspect of their remit. What a motivational video is is a piece of stimulus so it's like slapping someone on the shoulder before they go out on the pitch it's like a shot of stimulant before you go out into a fight that's all it is it's a simple piece of arousal to try and elevate a state of arousal you may already have or elicit a slightly different state of mind. Most of the time, sports psychologists would use a much more refined intervention if we're looking to alter a state of arousal someone has or maybe just their perception of the situation they're in. In these cases, we'll see things like framing being used a lot. We might also see something like a scripted pre-performance routine being used quite a lot. And these are highly refined tools that a psychologist will develop alongside an athlete and use that intervention repeatedly prior to the actual performance themselves. And it's a skill that the athlete acquires. It's a cognitive skill, a mental skill, and it's not just popping on YouTube to watch David Goggins lift a boat. The next thing then is that sports psychologists in general, aside from never prescribing something or using something like this, aren't all that common. So in Ireland, you have to do your undergraduate degree in in psychology or previously you would have been able to do an undergraduate degree in physiology or sport and exercise science or psychology. Then you have to do a master's specialization in sports psychology or exercise psychology or performance psychology. Then you have to do a few hundred hours of supervised work with a psychologist uh, or a sports or performance psychologist. You will then write your case notes while working with athletes under supervision of that sport and exercise psychologist. And then following on from that, you'll write an official casework piece, hand that up to the Psychological Society of Ireland. A board reviews that. They usually come back a number of times with different pieces in that review. And then after that process, you'll get put on a, a register for exercise psychologist or sports psychologist in Ireland. Ireland is by no means unique in this. Most countries will have a system similar to this. And so if you're looking for stuff like this, if you're an athlete or a coach, you're looking to bring in a psychologist into a, an area, don't bring in somebody who's a motivational speaker or some sort of guru in the area. Make sure you're bringing in somebody who's appropriately qualified. Now, the particularly disappointing thing about this and John talking like this about sports psychology isn't a kind of ego thing, but it's more so along the lines of recent studies show that coach-led psychological interventions are very, very effective. So a lot of the time we would have thought that uh, it has to be a sports psychologist leading these intervention pieces. You have to have a psychologist on staff with them. In fact, when you see sports psychologists working with coaches and then coaches implementing those psychological interventions with their athletes, you get very, very good results from that. And that makes sense. The coach works with that athlete on a daily or weekly basis. The coach understands pedagogy and how to teach, and therefore they'll be well able to bring in an intervention. And it's not some outside person who might only meet them once every month or two delivering that intervention so obviously it's disappointing when you see someone like this at this level in their game right at the top of no gi grappling talking like this about sports psychology probably because they had some bad experiences with it finally then i think it's really important to note that the sphere of consequence that a sports psychologist operates in is very very serious most of the time for most of the time for coaches SNC coaches, uh, speciality coaches, the, the arena of consequence is on sporting outcome. 
So do you get the athlete to a fight, injury free? The athlete, how does the athlete perform in that fight? Um, do we hit our markers? We need to see them hit for for morphology or strength outputs or power outputs. The arena of consequence for a sports psychologist is much more serious than that. And this comes down to their remit and their role uh, and their responsibilities with the athlete. Most of the time, only around 10 to 30% of your time spent with an athlete is actually working on motor cognition, skill acquisition, psychological interventions. A lot of the time a sports psychologist is spending with an athlete is being spent on the mental health of the athlete and the general well-being of that athlete. And so the biggest disappointing factor here is that when you see a coach speaking so poorly of sports psychologists and the sports psychologists he'd seen in the past is that those athletes then don't get that kind of mental well-being support that most full-time professional athletes will need. So it's much more serious than just the sports skill coach thinking sports skill is the best way of an athlete becoming more confident uh it's much more serious than a snc coach thinking snc is the most important thing for their athletes uh it's it's a very very serious thing if a full-time professional athlete is struggling with their mental health their mental well-being and then they're not getting the support they need because their head coach or their manager doesn't think sports psychology is something they should be looking into Thanks very much for watching another video. We have another video coming out on confidence later this week. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Please do like the video, subscribe if you're not already subscribed, and comment down below with your thoughts. If you'd like to see more videos like this, we have loads of Seeker Psychology videos on the channel. You'll find them very easily. Thank you.